Good morning, Life Church. I'm so glad that you are joining us in our virtual worship service, our ninth week of virtual worship services. I want you to sit back and kind of relax, but fix your mind and eyes on Jesus and take a few minutes and worship. We're going to have worship with our worship team right now. So again, praise with us. Come on to bless the Lord with us today. He has done great Your hands, clap your hands, rejoice. 
Come on, everybody, sing the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. I won't fear. Filled with anointing. I'm filled with anointing. My cup's overflowing. My cup's overflowing. No weapon can harm me. No weapon can harm me. I won't fear. I won't fear. People of God sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am not alone. I am not alone. Hey. He's my comfort.
Good morning, Life Church, and thank you for joining our virtual worship experience. I pray that you're staying safe, being cautious, but not being fearful. My name is Brianna, and I have a few announcements that I would like to share with you. This Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., we are having our How to Study the Word of God. And this Thursday at 6.30 p.m., our young adults are getting together for Bible study. And this Saturday, our life men are getting together at 9 a.m. to discuss relevant topics. All of these groups are virtual. And if you have an interest in either or, or all of them, in the comments below, you can simply say, I have an interest in joining the study group, the Bible study, or life men. And we'll have someone that will contact you with further details. And lastly, join Pastor Allen daily at 1215 for lunch break. This is a time for great discussions, interviews, and the study of God's word. So you don't want to miss it. Now, before we get started and listen to what God has to say to us, in the comments below, please answer this question. What is your favorite movie of all time? Mine is called Something New. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alan, lead pastor of Life Church, and I'm so glad that you are with us. And I hope that you are staying put, that you are staying safe. All of us know that we are living in unprecedented times. We've never experienced this. I've often said when I was in seminary, I didn't get any classes on a pandemic and didn't know what to do when it came. And most of us don't know what to do. I mean, this is a scary time. This is a time really of fear, fear over our children's lives. We have new strains of the virus, a fear of, about our economy or our livelihood, fear for our future. Many of us are gripped with fear in the midst of this time and this season. And I've been thinking about that, as in, in, in many of you are doing what I've done, and that is you're, you're watching news and you're reading news and you're hearing different statistics about this season. And I am wondering, what is God saying to me in the midst of this season? And what is he saying to us? In other words, what does God want us to know and what does God want us to do during this pandemic? And I didn't take me long to figure out that. I didn't have to hear God speak uh, out of the sky. I didn't have to hear a rumbling uh, voice. All I did was remembered other people in scripture who were going through their own dark nights of their soul. One person, and I actually talked about this a couple weeks ago, or this person, the prophet, minor prophet, his name is Habakkuk. You remember when he was going through his night of the soul, the darkest night of his, of his life? What did God say to him? And what did God say? I want you to know this and I want you to do. And this is what he said. In Habakkuk 2, verse 4, he said, my righteous ones shall live by faith. It seems like God is saying to us right now, we, we need faith. We need this type of faith that really that trusts that God has this thing. And so what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes and just like just dive in it and hit it as, as hard as I can. And that is faith. Three things, really. What is faith? What is biblical faith? A lot of people talk about faith and they seem to misunderstand it. But what is biblical faith? What is faith really? The second thing I want to talk about is what does faith look like? In other words, not just what is it in, in giving a definition, but if I were to see a person living a certain way, help me know what real faith looks like in a person's life. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is how. How can we walk by faith? Not just the definition, not just what it looks like, but I want to know personally, and I, want, I think all of us need to know in this time how to be people of faith and how to walk by faith. Because again, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God is saying to all of us, during this time that could grip us all with fear. 
I think he is saying, you got to have faith. And so let's figure this thing out so that we will live in authentic, biblical faith. So before I jump in, I just want to ask God to help. Father, thank you for this day. And I'm asking you that, to help me speak your message clearly and help people hear the message clearly. My prayer really, Father, in the midst of this is not only that we would be hearers of your word, but that we are doers of it. Help us live it out. Help us walk by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So in order to define faith, in order to talk about what it looks like and then how to do it, uh, I think the Lord led me to a passage that many of you know, and the passage is in the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews, if you were to read it from chapter one straight to the end, you'll see that uh, chapters one through 10, he seems to be letting us know uh, the superiority of Jesus, that Jesus is better, that he's better than angels, that he's better than Moses, that he's better than the old covenant, that Jesus is better, that he is superior. And then he transitions into chapter 11, where it seems like he's saying, yes, he's better. And you and I need to have faith. And if we don't have faith in this Jesus, there are dangers, he says in chapter 6 and chapter 10. But now in chapter 11, he says, so that you won't have any questions about what faith is, I'm going to define it for you. And not only am I going to define faith in chapter 11, I'm going to show you what it looks like, how it's lived out. And then we're going to learn just how we can live it out. It's in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, verse 1 starts. It's very, very uh, clear. What is faith? Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Verse two says, for by it, the, man, the men of old gained approval. So he's saying something about faith. He says, now faith is the assurance. That word there is really interesting because if you were to read it in the King James Version, it will say that faith, faith is the substance. And some people have uh, misunderstood this and misquoted it, saying that when it says that faith is a substance, that it's like this gooey thing that's inside of us that we could work, work your faith. That is exactly, that's absolutely not what the author is saying. When he says the word um, assurance or substance, the word actually means foundation. It means bedrock. It means assurity. It, it simply is saying that faith is the foundation for anything that I'm hoping for. What I'm hoping for in life is based, it finds its foundation on faith. And then it says it's also the conviction or it gives you it causes us to be convinced that these hope for things that we don't see will someday appear. In short, if you ask the question, what is faith? Faith is unwavering trust in God. That's why the second part of it says, for by faith, men of old gained approval. How did they gain approval? Because they had this unwavering, this bedrock, this foundational faith and trust that was rooted not in things, not in people, not in your healing, not in material things, but that was rooted in God and God alone. Question for you. What would it look like if we lived our lives with unwavering faith and confidence in God? Think about it. How would that change the things that we think about? What we talk about? Our interaction with people? 
If we really lived our lives day to day, moment by moment, with this unwavering confidence that what God said is true, and I believe it, I think that it will change everything. I believe it will change our marriages. I think it will change our interpersonal relationships. It will change how we interact with people at our jobs. It will change what we buy, what we give. If we had this unwavering confidence and trust in God, not just as an entity, but in what God says. That, to me, is a simple answer, what faith is. I think that it's this, this thing, it's a foundation. It's the foundational thing of my life, that when I leave this house, when, whatever, whenever I'll leave this house, or whatever I do, and the people that I talk to, and when I'm reading, and what I'm experiencing, uh, when I have entertainment, I'm doing all types of things. I, in the midst of it, I'm still trusting in God. But what does that look like? I mean, that's the definition. What is faith? It's the unwavering trust in God. But what does it look like? That's found in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 11. I think that not only is the author giving us a, a, a textbook definition, what faith is, but it also gives us a real life picture of what it looks like. Look at verse four. He says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So I would encourage you if you just Take some time and list, read the, the story of Cain and Abel right after the, 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 uh, the Lord created this wonderful earth, this world, this universe, and then put his prized possession, his prized uh, creation to live in it and to live in a creation that supports life. It's such an act of love and to live in a creation that provides so beautifully and fully everything that our first parents needed. In chapter three, they decided that even though they're happy that God has given everything that they need, they didn't need him. And so they made their choice that they were going to put themselves on the throne of their hearts, not God. And God said, have at it. If that's what you want, then this is how it's going to work out for you. And then he talks about the fact that the, the earth was cursed. And he talked about the fact that, that there will be a type of enmity, a war that goes on between humans and the enemy who wants to take authority over your lives. He talked about the fact in Genesis 3 that there will be a savior that's going to reclaim what was lost. But then you see that not only was this earth cursed, but relationships were cursed. And so what happened in chapter four, right after this, the fall of Adam and Eve, we see murder taking place. Relationship, uh, relationships is really the, one of the number one um, uh, curses or repercussions for the fall of Adam and Eve. It destroys relationships. It's because of the fall, my friends, that we have racism that we have classism, that we have sexism. In all of these isms, it destroys relationships. And I know I took you around the world just to get you across the street. But in chapter four, uh, we see Cain and Abel. And what happened was Cain and Abel were giving an offering to God. It appears, though it wasn't written, but it appears that God communicated to both of them the type of offering that he accepts. God always commu communicates not only to them, but to all of us what he requires. In John 14, he says in verse six of chapter 14, he says, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. God always lets you know what he requires. And he, I believe he did in chapter four. But Abel and Cain, they brought an offering to God. Abel's offering was accepted as he brought from the fatlings of his animals. He slaughtered an animal and he gave it to God. Now Cain, he brought some fruit, vegetables. And God said, Abel, I accept your offering, Cain, I don't. And instead of, of Cain making a decision that, okay, God, uh, I'll do better. Can I do something different? Instead of having a conversation that got with, with God, he took it out on Abel and he killed him. I know I'm giving you all this information, but he killed Abel. And we see now the first murder, the first taking of a person's life. Taking a person's life because they're hating on that person. Taking the person's life because in this case, Abel's offering was accepted, Cain's wasn't. And so now, thousands upon thousands of years later, God is still talking about Abel. That's why he says his blood still speaks. God is still testifying to the faith of Abel. What Abel did, what he seemed to have done, is he heard from God what needed to be offered and he obeyed him. What does faith look like? First thing I'm going to share with you is faith looks like obedience to what God says. Very simple. Years ago, I was a part of a church and faith was so uh, complicated. You had to just, you, you know, you know, you had to say the right things. You had to confess the right things. You had to claim the right things. And what you say will come to you. And you had the power to call those things which are which are not as though they were and all that kind of stuff. I remember that years ago. It was so complicated. But when you look at what faith looks like in in, in Hebrews chapter 11, faith simply looks like obedience. You see, faith is obedience to what God says. What am I talking about when I say obedience to what God says? If God says, love your enemies, faith says, I believe you, God, that if you say it, then you are all wise. I'll do it. If God says, forgive those who mistreat you, faith says, I don't understand everything. I don't understand the details of this command, God, but I trust you and I'll do it. If God says, love your spouse like I love you, I say, nah, <laughs> faith says, yes, I'll do that because I know, God, you are all wise. And if I just follow you and obey you, I can trust that it will work out fine. Faith is obedience. It's what it looks like is obedience to what God says. And that, my friends, is authentic faith. It's not faith in things. It's not faith in uh, your, your health or for your health. It's not faith that you have the power to extinguish the coronavirus, as I've heard many preachers say that we need to put our faith against this coronavirus and stop it. No, faith, the foundation of it is obedience to what God says. The passage goes on to give you another picture of what faith looks like. It's found in verse 5 of chapter 11. It says, not only did he talk about Abel and Cain, but he talked about a man named Enoch. He says, and faith, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. So when you think about this, now, God had this servant. His name was Enoch. The scripture says that Enoch 
pleased God. I've often wondered, what was he doing that brought pleasure to the heart of God, that made God look at him and say, this is my beloved, in him I am well pleased. What was it that Enoch did? Just in my mind's eye, it's like my sanctified imagination. I don't know how sanctified it is, but when I think about this, I can see Enoch in his just normal interactions, walking down the road, being in public. I can see him talking to this invisible God. I can see him just having just normal conversations, being very, it's almost as if God was there in the flesh. I can see him being faced with very troubled times and his go-to will not be to complain. His go-to would be, God, you're here. I know it. It seems like Enoch had this unwavering trust in the power of God and everything that God says and everything that God does. And nothing, I believe, shook Enoch. If Enoch was translated into this century, I don't think the coronavirus would shake him. That doesn't mean that he would walk in the streets without a mask and without gloves because he has faith in God. No, that's having foolishness in man. That's not wisdom. Let me say that really quickly. You need to hear that. Some people think that that true faith is that you're going to go back to church right now, that you're going to open your businesses right now and walk in and trust in the power of God that he's going to keep it away from you. They, I've heard people say that, that he is going to heal you, that he's going to make sure that your family and that you are fine. I want to say really quickly, that's not faith. That's foolishness. And let me say this. And I know that I'm taking a, 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 I'm running and chasing a rabbit. I do that often. That is not faith. That's hate. Please hear me clearly. That's hate. That's being a narcissist. That's saying, I believe that God is going to heal me. Well, even if that's true, what about your neighbor who may not believe that? What about your church member who isn't even thinking about that? Don't you care about them? Us being sheltered in is not really just about us. I think it's primarily, I think it's primarily about others. What do you think? Going back to Enoch, and I was simply talking about my sanctified imagination, and I am thinking about Enoch and how he brought pleasure to God. I think he just lived a normal life. If he were here today in this uh, century, I think he would just be uh, doing what he's been asked to do. He would shelter in, but he would be enjoying God. He would be praising him. He would be thankful for the fact that he has breath, that he can even be alive to experience this time. He would just enjoy people. He would have trust in God. So if I were to think about what faith looks like, the first thing I said is faith looks like obedience to God. But I think it also, faith also looks like bringing pleasure to God. That's living a life where you are actually bringing pleasure to God. You are causing God's heart to be full when he looks at you. Because why? Because you day to day, Moment by moment, you trust him. You trust him so much that you don't care what happens in your life. You know that God has you. You know that even in this broken world, I experience the brokenness of it. He's got me. He's going to bring me through. And even if I die because of coronavirus, I am in his hands. And I am entering into real, authentic life, not a life that begins to crumble when it gets old, not a life that has a shelf life, but I'm entering into real life. I believe that what faith is, is unwavering trust in God, is rooted in God himself. And I think what faith looks like is obedience to what God says. He says it. I really believe it. I got you, Lord. You're telling the truth, and I'm simply going to 
follow you because you're right. And I believe that what it looks like is bringing pleasure to God. I think the final thing is found in verse six. Chapter 11, verse six. And I could actually take two or three weeks to go through the entire chapter, one through 40 of Hebrews. Chapter 11, one through 40 verses. But I'm going to stop at six and look at this final thing that what faith looks like is this. 11.6 says, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. What does faith look like when you look at that verse? You know what faith looks like to me? Faith looks like constantly and regularly seeking God. Jesus said it this way. He says, ask and you should be, it should be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. You have to understand when he said that word, those words, ask, seek, and knock. He was really saying, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Because true faith continues. True faith is diligent. True faith is persistent. True faith does not give up. And that's why he said in this verse, uh, the author says that without it, you can't please God. And see, a part of pleasing God and a part of, uh, of, of living out your faith is your constant desire. And you don't give up. I'm seeking you, Lord. I want to seek your face. The psalmist said, when, when you said to me, son, seek my face, I said back to you, your face, I will seek. And true faith is not seeking other things to fill you up. It's not seeking other things to give you satisfaction as primary things. All these things may not be wrong. Other things, whether it's entertainment, whether it's uh, whatever it is that you find uh, joy and happiness and gladness in, those things may not be wrong. But if they are primary, then they are wrong. But our primary thing that we are seeking and trying to apprehend is God himself. If you want to know what faith looks like, it looks like obedience to his word, everything he says. It means bringing pleasure to him. But it also looks like our continual seeking of God's face, wanting him to show up. Uh, I, I know, I remember a time that um, when things were kind of tough for me and I found myself not seeking much, that spending a lot of time in a lot of things, other things became primary to me. Everything, the uh, other thing, I can list some of those things that became primary. And I remember enjoying those things sometimes, actually uh, having fun with those things. But then I started getting empty. And I remember one day, Lying in the bed, Marcia and I are sitting there watching television. I was escaping, looking at something. And I remember uh, having this emptiness in my gut. I can't really explain the feeling. Almost like my bones were creaking, like something in me was just not right. And I remember saying to Marcia, I got to go into the other room. And I just went into another room, turned the lights off and got on my knees, and I just started talking to God. I started seeking him. It's almost like I missed him. And I was saying to him, God, I, you know, all these things I put primary and first place in my life, but they don't satisfy. Lord, I'm coming to you, and I'm seeking you because why? I have faith that in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. True faith, what it looks like. It looks like a heart that seeks after him. It's very important during this season to be God seekers. Because that's what faith does. But you may ask me, Alan, I hear you. This seems theory to me. 
what faith is. Faith is unwavering trust in God. What faith looks like, it looks like obedience to his word or what he says. It looks like bringing pleasure to God. It looks like a constant seeking of his faiths. But how do I do it? How can I walk by faith? And I'm really glad you're asking because I have a couple things I want to share with you. The first thing I I want you to think about is as a takeaway. If you want to know how can I walk by faith, the first thing is ask God to help you. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with that. If you, wanna, if you want to walk by faith, let's start with prayer. Some of you right now, during this pandemic, during this sheltered in place order, not only are you antsy, but you're extremely bored. And not only are you bored, but you feel a little distant from God. It almost seems like your prayers are simply hitting the ceiling. God is saying true faith. If you want to know and you want to start this journey of walking by faith, say, God, I need some help. That's exactly what this gentleman said to Jesus when Jesus was going to heal. He says he was going to heal a child. You may remember this. It's in Mark chapter nine, verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help me. I remember years ago being in a church and they would tell me, don't ask God for for faith. You need to go get it by doing something else. And I'll share that with you in a few minutes. I had a problem with that because when I look at this passage, I see that Jesus didn't rebuke him. He didn't say, no, 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 don't ask me for that. No, he says, I give it to you. You don't produce it. The second thing I want you to think about if you want to walk by faith, is listen to this. This is very important. Regularly think on Jesus' love toward us. Why is that important? Again, to walk by faith, it's important for us to ask God for help. Number two, I think that it's important for us to regularly, on a regular basis, you need to be meditating, you need to be thinking on the love of Jesus, how much he loves you, the work he's done for you. Why is that important? Well, I find it in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And this is what the verse says. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, many people think that what what Paul is saying is your faith comes by reading the Bible. No, reading the Bible is very, very important. But all he had, the Bible that he had, that he was referring to was the Old Testament. When he says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ in the context, the word of Christ is not the Bible. In the context, the word of Christ is the good news. That whole context, you remember, he says he talks about Romans 10, 9, how we are to get saved. Romans 10, 10, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He he goes on to talk about how blessed it is for a person to bring good news. And the good news is what he's saying. He's saying that, that our faith will grow and we'll be able to walk by faith when we hear. Hearing does not mean just just having it come into our ears, one ear and go out the other. Hearing. Hearing means chewing on it, meditating on it, pondering it. When we hear the word of Christ, what's the word of Christ? I love you. I died for you. I lived this life and I took punishment for you. I was crucified for you. And I rose for you. Paul says this as it relates to the word of Christ in Romans 8, verse 32. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He who delivered up Christ, the father delivered up Christ for us because he did it. 
We can walk by faith and put our faith in a father who loves us because if he delivered up Jesus for us, then he says that you and I are valuable. We're valuable enough for him to send the son of his love. And because of that, we need to meditate on this. Think about it and it will increase our faith. So if we're going to walk by faith, we need to Again, we need to ask God to help us. We need to think about what God has done for us in Christ. Because if he went the length of sending his son, how should he not, with his son, freely give us all things? And the first thing, the final thing is, just start walking by faith. Just, by, just start walking. Just start stepping out by faith. Let me close this out by saying, you remember when Jesus told Peter to walk on water? That's a really interesting verse. It's in Matthew chapter uh, 14, verses 28 and 29. Look at what, just check out what Jesus said. And Peter said to Jesus, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, Tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Yeah, I'm not finishing the story. Yeah, he started sinking when he started looking at the waves and looking at the, the repercussions or the results of the wind. Yeah, he started sinking then. But what we need to do is to celebrate the fact that this man, Peter, was walking on water. <laughs> and I'm not trying to, to encourage you to get on the Detroit River and try it. But I am trying to show you that Jesus had this written in this book so that we would increase our faith and so that we will be like Peter. Walk by faith. Walk. Start walking. Putting your trust in him. What am I talking about? Starting today. Start Walking by faith as it relates to your money. God, what do you want me to do with this money? You said that we're supposed to do this with your money. Well, I'm going to walk by faith and do it. Even, that, even, even if it hurts, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Walk by faith as it relates to your body. Lord, I, I'm single and, and I, I know that what, what you tell me to do with my body, uh, that I'm supposed to give it to you. But Lord, I'm struggling and I'm, I'm lonely and I want to do other things. I want to start looking for love in all the wrong places. But I am going to walk by faith starting right now. I'm going to trust you. Put my trust that when you say for me that my body is yours, Lord, then I'm going to trust you. That's not just for single people. It's for married people too. Trusting God right now, starting by giving yourself your body to the Lord. Trusting in God right now, walking by faith as it relates to your mind. Lord, I'm not going to begin to shovel stinking thinking in my head anymore. I'm no longer going to sit be in front of a monitor and look at porn or it may not be that extreme or just look at or, or, or spend hours upon hours on things that don't that don't help. Lord, I'm going to start forging your word in my heart. I'm going to start meditating and thinking on what you've done for me. I'm going to trust you because you told me to do this. I'm going to trust you with my mind or you can walk by faith as it relates to all of your choices. What did he say? In all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. So what do you do? You trust in the Lord with all your heart. So starting right now, begin to, to, to start practicing a faith walk. I'm going to walk by faith.
as it relates to my money, as it relates to my body, as it relates to my marriage, as it relates to uh, my lifestyle, my choices, my uh, entertainment, whatever I'm doing right now, I'm going to start trusting your word and declare like Paul. And he said something that was really beautiful in 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. Because I, I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. So I'm asking you, and I'm really speaking to me during this very difficult time, to walk by faith. Trust him with all that he is and trust him with all that you have. Trust that he loves you. Trust without a shadow of doubt that he will help you. Trust that his word is true. Because what faith really is, is unwavering trust in God. What it really looks like is this obedience to what he says. He says it even if it makes me unhappy sometimes or it may even hurt. I believe it. And I'll do it. What it looks like is bringing pleasure to God. What, what it really looks like is a constant seeking God. So simply ask God to help you. He wants to help you in this time in order to help increase your faith. What you do right now is simply meditate on the love of Jesus. Because once we realize how vast that love is, you'll know that God will take care of you. And start walking by faith. And I, and I want to let you know, and I guarantee you, that when we do it, we're going to experience the unimaginable. We're going to experience things that we've never experienced. God is going to show himself to us in ways that he's never done. And I'd rather be like Enoch, live my life where God says, you're my beloved child. In you, I'm well pleased. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I ask that you would help us, God. Help our, our unbelief. We have faith, but we need more. And we're asking for your help. That you would put us in positions that we can use the faith that you've given us. That we would meditate on you, God, in order to, to grow our faith, knowing that the love of God is boundless. Help us, God, walk by faith in order to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I thank you for joining uh, us for Life Church virtual worship, and I hope that God has spoken to your heart. Wherever you are, I would love for you to write in the comments what God has said to you, said to you during this, this talk. What is he asking you to put your faith in? Some of you have dreams. What is he saying, trust me about this? Write it down as, as your way of confessing and building your faith. Say, this is what I want to trust God with. And I, I want you to know, we'll be praying with all of the, the things that you said. We'll be praying with you so that you would fulfill what God has promised in your life. And I will, again, see you this Monday at 1215 with lunch break. But before we close our worship, we will have our final act of worship, giving. God bless you. We hope the Lord spoke to your heart and you are strengthened and encouraged. And now is the time where you can worship in your giving. We have several ways where you can give safely and securely. We have our text to give by texting 84321. You can also give on the LifeChurchSouthfield.org website. We do have the Life Church Southfield app. And if you would like to give by way of check or money order, those can be mailed to 24293 Telegraph Road, Suite 210, Southfield, Michigan, 48033. We're greatly appreciative of all of your gifts. And before we go, we would like to close out in prayer. 
Lord, I pray that these funds will go far beyond we could ever imagine or think. Lord, that hearts and minds will be touched and that more people will come into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.